Luke chapter 22. We'll begin reading verse number 21 all the way through to verse number 30. And the message for today I've entitled, What Did Jesus Teach Us As the Last Supper Was Ending? You might remember from a couple of weeks ago, uh, we had some lessons learned at the Last Supper. Well, the supper is drawing to a close, and uh, around the communion table still sits Jesus and the disciples, and he gives us the information in this text at that time. Luke chapter 22, begin reading with verse number 21, but behold, The hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they begin to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And uh, there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. But it shall not be so But ye shall not be so, but he that is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I... Am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this host. Thank you for our Friends Day service and our friends that are gathered here with us. Uh, Lord, our heart goes out to friends who was taken to the hospital, Brother Roger and uh, uh, Sister Joyce, uh, hurting because she and they could not be with us at this at this time. God, please intervene in that uh, family. Please bring miraculous healing. Uh, Lord, we pray especially uh, for him and for Angie that's also in the hospital at this time instead of having the blessings of being in this uh, church chair. Lord, help them. Thank you for this wonderful singing, congregational, choir, these great special songs. Lord, help us. We need your help. Help us to learn today. And if there's anyone that has not yet given their heart to the Lord Jesus, help them to do that today. I pray that you will. Help me to preach, Lord, I'm inadequate in Jesus' name, amen. As we come to our text for today, the Lord had just instituted the communion service. We call it the Last Supper or the Lord's uh, Supper. And uh, that communion service is still observed by Christians all over the world in our day. 
we learned that the unleavened uh, uh, bread and the freshly squeezed juice, grape juice from the vine represented the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was necessary uh, for the salvation of our soul, the washing away of the sins of the world. In our text for today, the focus turns uh, from from Christ, you might say, to to, uh, the disciples and uh, also, of course, to us. As the Last Supper is ending, Jesus tells them that a betrayer sits at the table with them and is in arm's length. The startling statement caused 11 of the disciples to to question themselves and and one another saying is it is it I or who would do such a thing as this and none of them suspected Judas as he quietly got up and left the room they assumed that he went to buy supplies that the rest of them would need in their service. Uh, we're then told that the disciples, uh, for some reason, uh, began to talk about well, which one of us will be the greatest in, in the coming kingdom? Well, I, I wonder if I will be the greatest in the, in the coming kingdom. Will I have authority over you or will you have authority over me? And so much so that they, uh, the Bible said, Jesus, there's strife among them because of it. And of course, that gave the Lord the opportunity to teach them a lesson on humility and true Christian service. Uh, And then he assured them that they would indeed all have their place in the coming millennial kingdom. Here's my guiding thoughts for the message today. First of all, I want you to see that Satan's puppet is close at hand. I want you to see in the account the presence of a competitive spirit gets into the disciples. It's a bad thing. And I want you to see the promise of a coming kingdom is given. But uh, as the communion service comes to an end. We read these words, but behold, Jesus said, but behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me, is on the table. And he said, and truly, the Son of Man goeth as it was determined, but Notice he added these words of judgment to come, but woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. Can you imagine sitting at the communion table uh, with the man that he already knew would betray him. But he sits there at arm's length to Judas. Can you imagine reaching the bread, the unleavened bread, and, and the cup of, of pure grape juice 
to, to the man that, that you know is, is going to betray you. Can you imagine uh, sharing the whole purpose of this meal? He said, uh, th this unleavened bread is, is my body which is going to be broken on the cross and and this this juice this this is the blood that's going to flow from my veins for the salvation of the world and he and he shared the very meaning of the Passover meal with the man that he knew was going to betray him can you imagine how Jesus must have felt as Judas partook of the sacred elements before getting up and leaving the room? Can you imagine how that Jesus uh, experienced the communion supper? with the man that would betray him to his enemies and would actually lead them into the garden of, of prayer and, and actually uh, lead them and identify Jesus to them with a kiss upon his cheek. These events transpired in, in the text. The puppet of Satan is close at hand. Did you ever think about it this way? In intimate fellowships, secrets are shared, aren't they? In intimate relationships uh, confidences are are promised and all of that is about to be violated one of the things that makes me trail so devastating to, to all of us is that these Things will, will, will come along with the betrayal. It affects the very soul. Here's what we learn from the Eleven's perspective. Some people are masters at misleading. Some people are professional in their performances. And some people are deadly in their deceptions. Puppets of Satan may get with you and stay with you for a long time. Did you know this? Judas was never saved. And when he followed the Lord and joined the band of the disciples, the Lord was so gracious knowing that there was never conversion in his heart allowed him to, to come in. And now he had walked among them for over three years. Puppets of Satan may uh, get with you and, and stay with you for a long time. But remember this about puppets of Satan. Uh, time and circumstance will usually always reveal their true character. Puppets of Satan uh, may get by for a while, notice, if you will, 
how that Jesus uh, gave Judas this warning. He said, truly, uh, the Son of Man is going to go as it was determined. Yes, Judas, you're going to be successful in your, in your betrayal. You have sold me out for 30 pieces of, of silver. You're going to lead the, the, the wicked band of men uh, in disturbing my, my time of prayer. You're going to kiss me on the cheek. You're going to turn me over. I'm going to be crucified. That's determined. But, woe, he said, woe unto the man by whom he is betrayed. Puppets of Satan will not indefinitely get by. Their day is is coming. Ecclesiastes 8, 11 through 13, it talks about because time goes on and they see no... Uh, they see no uh, problem and they think they're getting by with their, with their sin. Says they might do it hundreds of times, uh, but they won't get by and it will not be well with them. Uh, judgment day is coming for the puppets of Satan. And here's God's admonition to you and I. How will we apply this to us? Well, the disciples sat there and the eleven said, Is it I? There was a time of heart searching, a time of looking inward. And it was appropriate. Did you know there's times, there's multiple times when all of us ought to look inward and, and do some heart searching. What is my relationship with the Lord like? Uh, the Bible says, and give no place to the devil. Give no place to the devil. You that have been in the military may be familiar with the term beachhead. And it's used, I think, to describe, you, you, know, you know, getting a place from which you can, you can, uh, hurt and destroy getting a place in the enemy's territory and the Lord said don't let the devil even get a place and not be dead in your life because when he does it's so easy to mess everything up uh, don't let uh, the devil Mess with your mind. Did you know the devil messed with Judas's mind? Said he, uh, the devil went first into his heart and then just walked right into him. And uh, the Bible tells us that, uh, that that God will give us. It's found in Second Corinthians chapter ten, verses three through five. That there's a battle that goes on in all of our minds. And we have the power, the, the stronghold uh, is, is, is there. The devil gets that beachhead, gets that stronghold. But he says we as Christians do have the power to pull it down. He's teaching us to guard our thought life and often search our hearts about our relationship with the Lord and stay close to Jesus. At all times, Satan's puppet is close at hand. Also in the text, there's the presence of a competitive spirit that gets into these disciples. Notice uh, how, I might say, educational the Bible is and how we can all learn things by exposing ourselves to times of teaching and preaching the Word of God. Notice, please, what happens. And uh, it, it says, 
there was also a strife. And verse 24, among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest? Isn't it interesting that at this critical time, the cross, maybe a mile and a half away from the guest chamber, was already casting its shadow. And Jesus was experiencing emotionally what he had soon uh, suffered physically on the, on, on the cross. And at this time of crisis, Luke records for us that that there is a, a, a strife that develops among the, the servants, the, the disciples, the, the very apostles, the, the, the most prominent servants of God. The strife develops among them and in the shadow of the cross. They take their eyes off Jesus and forgot what he said was going to happen to him. Paid no attention uh, to his uh, conversation with Judas because they were so consumed with themselves. Isn't it a sad commentary? That when others are going through hell, we can be oblivious to it all because we're so self-centered, self-conceited, always me, me, me. The presence of a competitive spirit is what we learn. A competitive spirit easily uh, slips into many people's lives, even Christians, even churches, even preachers, even apostles. Competitive, you know. Actually, if you if you really develop this thing, you'd see lurking nearby a demoniac spirit of competitiveness that will wreak havoc in people's lives if, if allowed. Uh, l- listen, here's what. To, uh, the scripture says, now I want you to listen to this. Uh, For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. There's no place for a competitive spirit in the, in the church of the living God, in the work of God. Did you know this? A, a competitive spirit always invariably causes strife. One. I'm getting ahead. I've got to do it better. Listen, I've got to have all eyes on me. Develops strife. Striving to be the best. Uh, That's what happened in the text. The presence of a competitive spirit causes the Bible word in 1 Corinthians 12, 25 is schism. It's the word meaning division. The presence of a competitive spirit 
will cause division in the body of Christ, in, the, in our churches. And uh, it is a demoniac presence because 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the, the wonderful thing about that whole chapter is that he, he likens the church family to the human body and how that God has so miraculously formed it and placed all of our organs where they are placed in the seemly ones, the ones we see in the unseemly ones, the, the ones that aren't too seemly, the hidden ones, the ones that, uh, that, that no one sees, and the ones that God does not want anyone to see. You know, God can see my heart, but you can't see my heart. You can see my chest, but you cannot see my heart. God can see my my heart, and and all the. I remember when we went through the first expansion of our old bill and the property falling from the ladder and crushing my heel, and I remember preaching on crutches for uh, several weeks. It was the most peculiar thing I've ever done. And I learned then just how important it is to have all of the parts of the body functioning the way they're supposed to be functioning, supplementing and helping and lifting up and sharing and caring with one another. I mean, think about the miraculousness of our human bodies, its agility. <laughs> how our mind tells our, our, our bodies what to do and our, our fingers to the very end obey instantly. The presence of a competitive spirit will mess with the proper functioning of the church of God. Now, you see, I'm not preaching this today because anything like that is going on. I'm preaching this today because it came up in the text and I don't want it to ever go on. One of the advantages to preaching through the Bible like I do and all the stories of the Bible is that no one can accuse me of preaching something just because they're there. But, of course, people are so mean they will anyway. But also, I want you to see that strife among Christians is, is the antithesis. It's antithetical to, to true Christian service. God places us all in the body as he knows we will be best in the place he places us the talents he gives us, the abilities he, he, he gives us. And obviously that gives rise to the need for us to all fulfill our, our God-given abilities and, and task within the, the local church. And may I, I say this, you are so very important to the cause of Christ, you do not even understand how important you are to the church. You put it out of your mind. Oh, it's not important that I'm there for that. It's not important that I do this. It's not, it's not important. Uh, but, but listen, you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It is important. You are more vital than you ever imagined. I don't do anything. Well, uh, what does your appendix do? Nobody can figure that thing out. But God put them in there. They do something. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, what I'm saying to you is the presence of a competitive spirit. Never let one of those things 
get into your life. Uh, Notice, please, that competition is characteristic of people with a world, worldly view. Jesus proves that. He said of them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise, uh, you know, authority over, over the other people. And the Gentiles, of course, it wasn't that God didn't love them, wasn't that God wasn't going to save them. But what he is saving is, is that the, the Gentiles had a worldview. You and I are to have a biblical worldview. They had a world worldview. Competition is a world worldview. Think of all the competition that goes on in America today. And, you, you, you know, probably in some of your minds in the sports world, you may go back to, uh, what was her name, Tanya Harris, the, the, you know, and all of that. Hardy, Tanya, Hardy. Because they, they wanted to win so bad. That to get rid of the competition, there's no place for that stuff in the house of God. No place for that stuff in the body of Christ. Competition. Here's what we, here's what we learn. The serving Christian is the greatest Christian and the most Christ-like Christian that you can ever find. He really is. Jesus said, well, there's that great king. You know, he has someone serve him. And they say the king is great because he's being served. But he said, I want you to notice something about me. He said, I am among you as one that serves. Didn't he say that? I am among you as one that serves. as he that doth serve. Listen, the serving Christian is the greatest Christian that there is. The the believer that lets these things get into their mind that uh, they they want somebody to be serving them. You know, uh, I've had people over the years asked me as I dealt with a public and invited multitudes of people to church and uh, sometimes they come don't like me at all won't go back won't come back but uh, uh, other times they, 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 they like me and they will come back but uh, you know I've, I've, people, I've had people ask me this as well what does your church have to offer us what does your church have to offer me It's a a good question. I think that every church ought to have something to offer you. I I really do. I think every church should have something to offer you and and your your family and your kids of all ages. I I think they uh, should have something to offer you. But that shouldn't be your mindset. Wasn't it President Kennedy in his administration said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country? You see, it speaks better of you if you say, what can I do for your church? What can I do for our church? What can I do? How can I contribute? What part can I play? Me and my family, what can we do? How can we contribute to the the greatness of the work of God? That is is, is the true Christian mindset. Serving. The serving Christian is the greatest Christian. And the text teaches us that. And here's what the Bible says. If you look back in uh, chapter 14, you might remember uh, in around verse number 11, Jesus said, Whosoever exalteth himself 
shall be abased. That means to be brought low. And he that humbles himself shall be exalted. There they sat around the table trying to exalt themselves. <laughs> I, I, I think I can preach better than you, James. I, 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 I think I can I think I can I can have a better, bigger class than you. Matthew. If I'd have brought that sermon, this is what I would have said. Everybody like this preaching today, we're not we're not we're not walking the golden streets of glory today. We're right down where the rubber meets the road. We're learning what how God wants us to walk in the dust of the world. The serving Christian is the the greatest Christian. He that exalts himself shall be abased. Listen, God's got a way of showing you just how big you are. You know, God had to knock the Apostle Paul off his high horse as he went down to Damascus to rescue him some Christians. He's so righteous. God knocked him off his high horse. Let me tell you something. God's got a way of knocking you off your high horse. And he will knock us off of our high horse. We'll be abased, he said. Uh, listen. Here's what James would later add. He had probably reflected, you know, it's the Lord's brother, but he probably reflected back upon uh, on the stories the other apostles uh, uh, told, you, you know, uh, at the ending of the Last Supper. And he penned these words, humble yourself in the sight of God, and he will lift you up. Lastly, as the supper is ending, there's the coming kingdom that is promised. Notice the text once more. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Yeah, you guys are sitting there arguing over which one of you going to be the greatest. But, but all of you is with me, and you, you, you've you stuck with me in your temptations. So, uh, you know, I have to straighten you out from time to time. Uh, but uh, here's what I'm going to do for you. And I, 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 here's how much I love you. Here's what I'm going to do for you. He said this. He said, uh, you are they which have continued with me in my temptations. Uh, did you know this? There are Christians that continue. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Uh, John chapter 8 and verse number 31, continuing Christians. You know, let me give you an admonition. Don't focus on those that don't continue. Look at the, the ones that do continue. And there are many of them. Notice, he said, the continuing believers. The apostles are given this promise. They will rule with Christ during his millennium. He said, and I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. And now notice this that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And notice this, and sit on thrones. And Matthew talks about the 12 thrones, uh, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, let me tell you what to do. Believe that exactly as it's written. And you'll be on safe ground. 
Jesus promised that during his coming millennium in this world, those 12 apostles that argued over who would be the greatest among them, you know, all that stuff be straightened up and each one of them would judge a tribe of the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel will be the focal point of the millennial kingdom. It will be the head nation in all the world. All the rest will be the tail nations and all the nations of the world will send representatives up once a year to the headquarters in Israel. And 12 Apostles will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now let me draw, draw the message to a close like this. Following Christ does not only give eternal salvation. Following Christ gives eternal rewards in heaven. I'll be finished in about three minutes. But let me get this into your mind. A believer that follows the Lord Jesus Christ will be rewarded. Not only will they have eternal life, but they will have rewards. There's at least five, you know, that rewards that believers, in addition to these apostles, you and I can have in eternity. We can have the victor's crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 25 through 27. That's to overcome the flesh and serve God in spite of it. To bring yourself under subjection and not give in to the body, but give in to the spirit. There's the crown of rejoicing, 1 Thessalonians 2.19. You bring somebody to Christ or you're instrumental in bringing someone to Christ. They will be your crown of rejoicing. That's a soul winner's crown. Are you trying to win any souls? The, the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy 4, 8, be given to those that love God and love his appearing. And uh, 1 Peter 5 and 4 says there's a crown of glory that can be won and will be given to faithful pastors and teachers. And then there's what's known as the crown of life which will be given to those that overcome the temptations like those in this text did and, and serve God in spite of their frailties. And in addition to all of that, there will be leadership positions in the world. And if you say, preacher, you've already lost me, let me say this, Isaiah 9 and 7 says of the increase of his government, there will be no end. I can't tell you how great heaven is. I can't tell you how great eternity is. But go out and look into the heavens and you'll see how great the things of God are. And we will all be a part of that our relationship with the Lord every one of us there's enough planets there's enough stars there's enough places in the universe that has no end there's a place out there it would be no problem at all for God to give you a whole city to rule over or a whole planet now don't go out of here and say I'm a nut I'll say you're a double nut but let me say this, friend. There's a promise of a kingdom. We're going to stand our feet just now and keep me on. Don't turn me off as the pianist comes. Here's what we've learned today. The puppet of Satan is close at hand. Believers, at any given time in your life, the devil is within arm's reach. Joshua, the high priest, is pictured over, I think it's in the book of Zechariah, and he said Satan was standing at his right hand. Within arm's reach stands the devil that wants to destroy you and your life and your family and will, if he can at all. The puppet of Satan. Never be a puppet of Satan. Never let that 
the presence of a competitive spirit invade your Christian life. Never do that. Love one another. Be kind one to another. Don't expect to be better than one another or anything. You get in the place that God knows you to be best in and you stay there. And let's live in the light of the promise of heaven and the coming kingdom.